coming to you live from Mountain View. All right, so um, Peter Seibel describes himself as a writer turned programmer turned writer. Um, I first became aware of him when I worked for Sun, and he worked for WebLogic, and he sent me a very convincing piece of email asking me to put chained exceptions into Java. Uh, it convinced me, and so I did. So if you're a Java programmer who has benefited from chained exceptions, you have Peter to thank. Um, let's see, after that, he worked for a startup that did a Java-based transactional mes messaging system. Um, and then he took a couple years and wrote uh, this great common lisp book called, what? Practical common lisp. Um, it won a Jolt Award. And uh, then he wrote this book called Coders at Work. I could tell you all about it, but that would leave him with nothing to say. So instead, why don't we give a warm welcome to Peter Seibel. All right. So uh, this book, as some of you have seen, just a show of hands, who's actually read it already? Anyone? Josh? Couple of people. Okay, so you all have that to wait for, uh, in store for you, hopefully. Um, so I'll just give you a brief o overview of what the book is. Um, it's 15 Q&A interviews with, I like to say, notable computer programmers. I did not make any attempt to say these are the 15 best programmers working on the planet. Um, I tried to make a book that was balanced in various ways, so it wouldn't be all you know one kind of programmer. I did also have a sort of bias, for perhaps obvious reasons, of selecting programmers who I thought would be interesting to talk to. So the, the totally indrawn, mad genius who only grunts would not be a good candidate for an interview. And so those people, despite their prodigious coding skills, were left out. Um, but I think I got a good selection of people. Um, actually, the, the story of how I got this set of people I did is a little bit interesting. A long time ago, when I, long time ago, years ago, when I started work on this book, I put up a website and asked for suggestions of names. Um, and made some whizzy UI stuff to let people sort the names in various ways. And I ended up with about 284 suggestions of names of programmers who someone thought would be worth interviewing. Um, and then people sorted them in various ways. And I think actually Peter Norvig, your, uh, what is he now, VP of Research or whatever he is, um, was the top of the list. He might have lost at the very last minute, uh, John Carmack pulled ahead of him. And John Carmack would have been a great guy to have in this book, but he never replied to any of my emails or physical letters. Um, but I uh, whittled down that list to the 15 people who are in the book. And uh, I'll just, actually, I was sort of curious to see, since none of you have mostly have read the book, then you can just answer this. So who here has heard of Jamie Zawinski? Raise your hand. About 50%. Uh, Brad Fitzpatrick, fellow Googler, about the same. Douglas Crockford, a little less. Uh, Brendan Ike, inventor of JavaScript. Josh Block. Very nice. Uh, Joe Armstrong, inventor of Erlang. Yeah, a few. Um, Simon Peyton Jones, more. Peter Norvig, very good. Who doesn't know Peter Norvig here? Um, <laughs> Guy Steele, a lot. Yes, he's everywhere. Uh, Dan Ingalls, inventor of, or co inventor of Smalltalk. Uh, Peter Deutsch, L. Peter Deutsch, but fewer. Yeah. Uh, Ken Thompson, another Googler. Yes, inventor of Unix. Um, Fran Allen, very few. Turing Award winner, you guys should know who she is. Um, Bernie Cosell, nobody. See, I'm really proud of having Bernie Cosell in this book because as you'll hear, he's a really interesting guy. And Donald Knuth. All right, you, you're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, uh, so I sat down with all of these people. All the interviews were done in person over between four to six hours, all recorded on little digital recorders and laboriously transcribed and then edited down. Um, probably about two-thirds of the raw transcript was cut out to make the book. So if you think the book's too long, it could have been a lot worse. Um, and I, I sort of feel like this set of people that I interviewed, we've all heard perhaps of Sturgeon's Law that 90% of everything is crud, um, which he invented thinking about science fiction, but realized applied to everything. These people are the other 10%. Right? If you read programming blogs or forums or Reddit or whatever, it sometimes can be dispiriting and you think, wow, all programmers actually are really idiots, um, including yourself sometimes, perhaps. 
But if hopefully if you read these interviews, you'll realize that we're not all that way. Um, these folks were, you know, obviously had thought about their craft. There were very few dogmatic points of view on any of the latest, you know, back and forth about unit testing or test driven development or code ownership or you know, everyone had a sort of nuanced view of things, um, which was refreshing. So, and I basically, the, the goal of the book was to talk to people about, you know, how did they become the programmers that they are today? Um, I think A-Press sort of wanted a, a book that people could pick up and read and learn something about how to be programmers. I think it got, um, it's a little more subtle than that, however. I think, you know, A-Press sort of thought, oh, we'll just go ask a bunch of people a bunch of questions, and then it'll be very obvious. People have actionable stuff they can take away and apply to their craft. Um, but I don't know if they're disappointed, but um, at least some of my reviewers are disappointed. I, like every author on the planet, looks at the Amazon reviews. Um, a couple one-star reviews on Amazon. One guy said, I wanted more insight into how to become a great coder, but you won't find that here. Another guy said, I want to know how they solve problems. That's not a topic you'll find covered in this book. But a uh, coll er, colleague, friend of mine on uh, the Lisp IRC channel said to me the other day, I was going to say your book is more inspiring than enlightening, but after all, I think it is enlightening, however subtly. And I think he's got it right. Um, I'd loathe to be <laughs> agree with the one-star <laughs> reviewers. Um, in that there is no royal road to programming, right? You can't, uh, you know, there, there, it would be great if someone would interview a bunch of folks like this and produce a book that you would read it and then say, aha, that's how you become Donald Knuth. That's how you become Guy Steele um, in, you know, seven days. <laughs> <laughs> right, but we know that's not really how it works. And, um, and I was struck by that interviewing people that it's hard to get at what makes great programmers great. We know that the people in this book are great at what they do because they've produced great stuff, but it's, it's just a hard thing. I mean, if you know, you know all of probably, everyone here is a programmer, I assume, more or less. Okay, so you know what goes on in your mind and you know probably how hard it is to explain. Like, how do you make the decisions you make when you code? Um, and so it's, it's, it's a hard thing to get at. So I think we sort of have to read between the lines and also observe that these people became who they became over a long time. And so I started at the beginning of how they started out. Four of them started with basic, Dykstra rolling over in his grave. Four of them started with Fortran, um, and the other eight, uh, well, not, and eight of them started with assembly. I think I counted Guy Steele in there twice. Um, and they started sort of how probably anyone started who started when they did. Kids today starting will start somewhere else, but it's, you know, they, it's not obvious that they uh, started out very differently, except that they all did seem to have hands-on experience with computers, particularly some of them at a time when that was very unusual. So Donald Knuth happened to be at uh, Case, what well, I guess is now Case Western Reserve, where they had an IBM 650 and they let undergraduates touch it. So he got to sit down with the machine and debug programs and look at the programs in the manual and say, I could do better than that. Um, and then discover that, in fact, he could, um, but also how hard it was to debug a program. I think he said he wrote a 100 line program that had 100 bugs in it. <laughs> so sort of looking at uh, what people did, it really comes down to basics. The old three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, reading, you know, some, some, some author about, you know, a novelist said once, there are two ways to learn to write, read and write. And it seems to me, looking at these interviews, that that's true for programmers as well. Um, almost everybody I talked to made some mention of reading other code, reading other people's source code. A lot of them, that was really a formative experience, as I'll, uh, I'll show in a second. Um, I didn't get the sense, however, that programmers read as much maybe as they should, or even some people sort of said we should do it, but even they didn't really do it. I don't, like I imagine novelists probably read a lot of novels, like just regularly read novels. I didn't, even, even among the people I interviewed, I didn't get the sense that anybody just sort of regularly picked up a piece of code to read for fun. Um, some, a little, Brad Fitzpatrick actually sort of struck me as a little bit. He just grabbed the Android source code or the Chrome source code and just looked at it to sort of see how it worked for no particular reason. But mostly people read stuff that they were working on or that their team was working on um, with, with some exceptions that I'll go over. So 
uh, Jamie Zawinski started out, so as for those of you who don't know, he was um, an early employee at Netscape or at the Unix version of, of uh, Mosaic, or no, whatever it was called, Netscape, I guess, um, before it was Mozilla. And, but he actually got his start really at CMU. He was hired as a high school student to work at, in Scott Fallman's AI lab at CMU and got to work on Lisp machines. and got this very old school, he was sort of like, the Lisp culture was almost dying out and he, as a very young person, got enmeshed in that and sort of got it when other kids his age probably would have been playing with Apple IIs and stuff. Um, but, so he was there working on these Lisp machines and so he basically said he ended up reading a lot of the code you know, for these Lisp machines, just looking at how stuff worked. Um, and he, you know, I asked him if he was reading code that he wanted to work on or is it just for curiosity. He said, mostly, I just wonder how that works. The impulse to take things apart is a big part of what gets people into this line of work. And I certainly saw that in a lot of people. Um, Brad Fitzpatrick described how he didn't used to read code. You know, he was writing, he was programming since he was five years old on a boot, uh, homebrew Apple II that his father built. Um, and the story of how that computer came to exist is in the book and is amusing. But he said, for, there were a number of years when I wrote a lot of code and never read anyone else's. Then I got on, on, on the internet and there's all this open source I could contribute to, but I was just scared shitless that it wasn't my code and the whole design wasn't in my head that I couldn't dive in and understand it. And he describes, but he did eventually start sending in some patches to, to game the GTK instant messenger. And he said, and I was digging around in that code and I just saw the whole design. Just seeing parts of it, I understood. I realized after looking at other people's code that it wasn't that I memorized my own code. I was starting to see patterns. I would see their code and I was like, oh, okay, I understand the structure that they're going with. And so he said after that, he really enjoyed reading code because as he says, when I, whenever I didn't understand, understand some pattern, I was like, why the fuck did they do it like this? And I would look around. Brad also gets the prize for most cursing in his interview. Um, <laughs> it's actually cut down in the book. <laughs> I would look around more and I'd be like, wow, that's a really clever way to do this. I see how that pays off. And so he said, I would have done that earlier, but I was afraid to do it because I was thinking if it wasn't my code, I wouldn't understand it. So he sort of came over and as I said, he's the one who does seem to sort of just read code for fun. Um, like I said, Android, Chrome, Firefox, OpenOffice. Uh, Douglas Crockford is a big fan of Knuth's literate programming, but even he said he mostly read Knuth's prose instead of the actual code. Um, He's also a big fan of reading as a, as a group activity, sort of inspections kind of reading, and also uses that in interviews. If you interview over, you know, you get tired of working here, you go over to Google, interview with Doug Crockford, he's gonna say, you know, bring a piece of code that you wrote and let's read through it together as a way of, of understanding your, your skills. Um, Brendan Eich started out at, he was an undergrad, he was really a physics undergrad, but he got into some computing and they got a hold of the Unix source code and they looked at that and they looked at the C preprocessor, which he described as an amazing mess. Um, and so he started, you know, trying to understand that and trying to write a better one. Um, now he does, does read some other code, uh, think frameworks and stuff in JavaScript, obviously he's interested in, and also Python and Ruby. Josh Block didn't really say anything in particular about reading code, but I'm sure he approves. Um, uh, Peter Norvig, when he was young and grad school, whatever, he was at Berkeley and they had the source code of the Symbolics list machines and so he took a lot of look at that and he, again, it was just sort of what he was interested in. He's like, oh, this has an interesting feature, let me lo look into it. Um, how do they open files across the network when, you know, just the same way as they open files locally, which was newer then. Um, and Guy Steele, as always, was very articulate about stuff. So he uh, wrote a Lisp very early on, probably when he was in high school, a Lisp implementation for the, I guess, the IBM 1130 and he really credits the ability to read code. He was hanging out at MIT as a high school student, so they had the famous you know, drawer of source code listings. He says, I would not have been able to implement Lisp for an 1130 without having access to existing implementations of Lisp on another computer. That was a very important part of my education. Um, and so he said, part of the problem that we face nowadays, now that software has become valuable and most software of any size is commercial, is that we don't have a lot of examples of good code to read. And he goes on to say, open source has helped with that. Um, he, he also read Tech. How many people have actually looked at Tech, the program, Knuth's book? Yeah, a few. Um, I found, I asked everybody about literate programming and obviously Knuth was in favor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> everyone else was a little mixed. You know, there were people who were like, this interesting, you know, it it's interesting to read or it would be an interesting experiment to do but I wouldn't want to code that way all the time. 
Um, other people, like Ken Thompson is like, no, that's just, that's dumb, it can't work because you're writing everything twice. Uh, and other people said, yeah, it's interesting, but uh, the toolkit was never right. You know, there was, they only had it for C or whatever. So maybe Guy Steele said, maybe if they'd had good tool chains for literate programming in Lisp, he would have done it. Um, so it's, it has just sort of struck me that, you know, Knuth's been out there arguing for this and really getting nowhere um, on that front. Uh, Peter Deutsch, obviously, he didn't really talk a lot about code reading, but he, again, was at MIT with the drawer full of listings, and I think he was sort of famous, because he also went, you know, he was at MIT when he was, like, 13 years old, writing a Lisp implementation for the PDP-1, and I think sort of famously pulling listings out of the drawer and writing them to be, you know, twice as good and really annoying people twice his age. Um, Ken Thompson also, so he's a, a great example of the early code reading being very important. He was at Cal, they had um, this drum computer called the G15, and it had an interpreter for a language called Intercom on it. And they would use it a little bit in his double E classes. And so a friend of his, a grad student, had written an interpreter for Intercom. And so he got a listing of that and over vacation, a Christmas vacation or something, he said, I read it and just dissected it. I didn't know the language it was written in, which happened to be Nelliac, and it was just a marvelously written program. And I learned programming, Nelliac, Intercom, and how to interpret something, everything from that. I just sat and read it for probably the entire vacation, a week, and then came back and asked him questions about it, nagging little bugs kind of things. After that, I knew how to program, and I was pretty good at it. <laughs> um, Fran Allen, who's uh, been a researcher at IBM forever, she basically joined IBM in time to teach Fortran to IBM scientists, because Fortran had just been invented, and she had, was on track to be a math teacher, but needed to pay off her school debt, so took a job at IBM. Um, they said, oh, you're a teacher. Teach the scientists to use, IB, uh, to use Fortran on all their scientific stuff, because how else will we make everyone else use it if we won't use it? And she had to drag them, kicking and screaming. I observed that that's the last time scientists have adopted a new language. <laughs> um, but she, she too, uh, she's been, you know, started, other than the teaching, she started out as a programmer at IBM. Um, she worked on a, a, this operating system called the Monitored Automatic Debugging System. And she said she really remembers reading the original program. It was very elegant. Um, later on, she led research teams. She, she led the team that basically invented static single assignment you know, compiler um, technique. And one of her employees had built a parser. It was, it was actually the guy who wrote the parser that's part of the Jikes Java compiler. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. And so, uh, so she wanted to understand this, she said, well, she's, she said, it's probably the best parser in the world. It's out in open source now. And I wanted to understand it, so I took it and read it. And I knew that Philippe Charles, the man who had written it, was a beautiful programmer. The way I would approach understanding a new language or a new implementation of some very complex program would be to take a program from somebody that I knew was a great programmer and read it. Um, and that sort of actually gets, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but Guy Steele said something about, I guess I quoted a little bit uh, before, but he said, one of the problems that a lot of people seem to face with reading code is it's hard to find good code. I mean, it's open source, there's a gazillion things, but how do you know the stuff that we really ought to read? Um, and Guy Steele said, basically, it's hard to find good code that's worth reading. We haven't developed a body of accepted literature that says, this is great code, everybody should read this. So it tends to be one-page snippets and papers, um, chunks of code out of existing stuff. So you know, he, even he who was you know, saying that and saying how important code reading was, I asked him about some code he had actually read and he gave me an example, but it had been you know, three or four years since. So it's not like he's you know, picking up new code just to read for fun anymore, um, other than the stuff he's working on. Some of the folks I talked to actually gave pretty good advice about how to read code, I thought. Um, in some ways, maybe the most practical advice in the book, because it's, you know, it's a daunting thing. Here's a big pile of code, how do you get into it? Some people can just sort of start reading and suck it all into their brain, and eventually it's all there, and they can understand it, but I've never been able to do that. Um, so Zawinski gave some advice about just, you know, you just dive in and start reading it, and you can start at the bottom. He said, if you want to understand how Emacs works, start at the bottom. What are con cells made of? Um, if that doesn't work for you, sometimes starting with the build system, can give you an idea of how things fit together. Just trying to build the damn thing um, <laughs> will really show you, actually, and Brad Fitzpatrick echoed a similar thought, which is just pipe find into less while you're trying to build the thing and sort of look around and you'll see how things are structured. Um, and then uh, I think it was Zawinski who said, basically, once you get it built, 
you know, now you've built your own version of Emacs or Firefox, and now you can just make one stupid little change, change the title of some window, and now you've actually started working on the program and understanding a little bit how it, how it fits together. Um, Guy Steele talked about taking one function, you know, you want to look at Emacs, think about, well, somewhere it's got to insert a character. Let's find that, you know, take a task, something that's going to happen, and then just find the code that's going to show you how that, where that happens, you know, and eventually there's going to be something that increments some counter that, you know, moves the, the cursor along in the buffer. And as you've traced that whole path, you'll have looked at a lot of the code. Now go back up to the top, pick another thing, try that. Um, Brendan Ike took a different approach, which is often to take a big, when I mean, big programs are sort of hard to read because, you know, they're hard, um, throw it into the debugger and just trace around sort of more dynamically, get a view that way of, of what's happening as the program runs and that will drag you through the source code in a way that's actually, you know, you're going to see the flow of control. Um, but he also did say, really understanding it is this gestalt process that involves looking at different angles of top and bottom and different views of it, playing in the debugger, stepping through in the debugger, incredibly tedious that that can be. Let's see. But he, and he, he sort of cautioned that simply reading source code without firing it up and watching it in the debugger can be uh, misleading in the sense that you, you can go a long way reading source, but you can also get stuck and get bored and convince yourself you understand something that you don't. Um, I think the, the Zawinski approach of trying to change something is sort of a, also a guard against that. Right? If you actually try and change it, you'll discover where your understanding has failed. Um, <coughs> another way to read code that comes up more in debugging, two, two people mentioned. Um, so let me, Bernie Cosell, who none of you have heard of. Bernie Cosell was one of the three software guys who wrote the software for the IMPs, the internet message processors at BBN, the first four nodes of which were the first four nodes of what is now the internet. Um, so BBN had been contracted by ARPA to build this thing as a, basically an experiment and he, Bernie Cosell and two other guys wrote all the software in assembly for some hardened Honeywell 316. Um, so he was, you know, I, I've read in some you know, old software books, methodology books, they say, you know, one thing you should never do is patch the binary. You know, you read that now and you're like, what are they talking about, patch the binary? <laughs> That sounds insane. Um, so when Bernie Cosell joined the IMP project, he was the third one on just by a, a couple months, and so the two other guys had done a little bit of work. And one of the other guys seriously thought the best way to maintain their source was they had you know, the assembly listing, and they would assemble the thing, and it would be running, and then they'd find a bug, and so they would find you know, the patch they needed to make, to, and he would write in his notebook, you know, at this place, put a jump to over here, have this little code, and then jump back to this address. And they would load that patch onto the system, and he would have in his notebook. So there was no source code listing of the system as it was running, because they just had patch after patch after patch piled on. Now, the guy who was doing this was very disciplined with the, the notebook, and he recorded everything that happened. But to get the source, you had to take the original listing that was how many weeks old, plus this guy's notebook and apply the patches in the right order. So Bernie Cosell came in and said, like I think any sane person would say, this is crazy. And he went through the exercise over a weekend of applying all the patches and generating a new listing and then saying, you know, come Monday, there was a still running system, but now was generated from a clean listing. And he said, from here on out, we're putting the patches in every night and generating a new listing. Um, but he, so all of these guys were clearly sort of masterful assembly programmers that they could even begin to get away with that. Um, and Cosell was at BBN, so this was when BBN was just a hotbed of innovation. I mean, they were doing the, uh, the internet, they were doing AI stuff, um, they had a lot of connections with MIT, uh, they're in Cambridge, and uh, though they, they tended to hire people like Cosell who were MIT dropouts because they were just as smart and a lot cheaper. Um, <laughs> so he, he had sort of bailed on MIT in you know, sophomore, junior year went to work at BBN where he developed a reputation, and he's mentioned in the book where wizards stay up late, which is about the invention of the internet. Um, he developed a reputation as being this masterful debugger. And I asked him about that, and he said, well, that's sort of fake, because what happened was they would have these bugs that nobody could figure out, and so they'd give it to me, and I'd go and I'd read the code, and I'd read the code, and I'd read the code, until I got to a point where I didn't understand what I was doing, and then I would rewrite that part. Um, 
And he, he said, this is a terrible way. I can't believe I got away with it. But he basically would build his own model, not of how the code did work, but how it ought to work, um, and get far enough in that then when he said, OK, where it seems to be doing doesn't match what I think it ought to be doing, I'm just going to make it do what I think it ought to be doing. And apparently you know, got away with that over decades. Another person who has apparently adopted this technique is Peter Norvig, um, who was also a little shamefaced about it, but um, it, which goes a bit, I think, also to the point of how hard it is to read code. If you don't, you know, you didn't write it and you try and dig into it, eventually it's just like, you know what, this, I don't understand this. It's, I'll just rewrite it. That'll be, that'll be easier than, than figuring it out. Another, another layer of rigorous programming. Right. So the one guy who was a real inspiration on this front, reading code, is Donald Knuth. Um, inspiration on many things. I mean, so this guy obviously reads I mean, his job is to sort of read almost everything in an area and distill it down into something the rest of us can pretend to understand. Um, so he, you know, he talked about looking at uh, Babylonian manuscripts of how they described algorithms in ancient Babylonia 4,000 years ago, just to sort of see how did they think about algorithms. Um, and then he found a, a Sanskrit document from the 13th century about combinatorial math and really felt, this was actually quite sweet, he felt like the guy who wrote this thing in the 13th century in Sanskrit, probably there was nobody he knew who understood what he was talking about. <laughs> but he had these ideas about combinatorial, what we would now call combinatorial math, um, and Knuth found a translation of this document, and it he felt like this guy was talking to him. Like he understood him and he's like, I had those same thoughts as I was getting started in computer programming. And so this poor guy, he'll never know, but he actually did find someone who understood him in Donald Knuth. But Knuth, and so Knuth talked, was, this was in the context of how important reading source materials are to him. And so the source materials and also computer code. And he said, I was unable to pass that on to any of my students. There are people alive now in computer science who are doing this well, a few, but I could count on the fingers of one hand the people who love source materials the way I do. And he went on to describe all his collections of source code, various compilers from the 60s that were written in interesting ways, and Dijkstra's source code to the, the, the operating system, um, which he hadn't read, but he's holding for a rainy day, and um, <laughs> described one time he broke his arm, he fell off his bike and broke his arm and was laid up, couldn't really do much, and so he read source code for a month, and th that was a really important experience for him. Um, and so I was sort of asking him the standard question, of like, well, how do you do this? And again, the, there's no royal road. Like, he didn't have any uh, easy answer to how you read source code, but I'll, I'll read this passage. It's a little long, but I'll read it because it's so inspiring to me um, about how he does it. So he was saying, well, it's, it's really worth it for what it builds in your brain, reading, reading source code. So how do I do it? Well, there was a machine called the Bunker Ramo 300, and somebody told me that the Fortran compiler for this machine was really amazingly fast, and nobody had any idea how it worked. I got a copy of the source code listing for it. I didn't have a manual for the machine, so I wasn't even sure what the machine language was. But I took it as an interesting challenge. I could figure out begin, and then I would start to decode. The operation codes had some two-letter mnemonics, and I could start to figure out. This was probably a load instruction. This probably was a branch. And I knew it was a Fortran compiler, so at some point, it looked at column seven of a card, and that was where it would tell if it was a comment or not. After three hours, I had figured out a little bit about the machine. And then I found these big branching tables. So it was a puzzle, and I looked at how these primitives are used. How, do they, uh, how does that get used by higher levels in the system? And that helped me get around. But really under, oops, I'm reading the wrong thing. <laughs> Into Brennan Ike. Um, it's a puzzle, and I kept making little charts, and I'm working like I'm working at a security agency trying to decode a secret code. But I knew it worked, and I knew it was a Fortran compiler. It wasn't encrypted in the sense that it was intentionally obscure. It was only in code because I hadn't gotten the manual for the machine. Eventually, I was able to figure out why this compiler was so fast. And then, being the algorithms guy, unfortunately, it wasn't because the algorithms were brilliant. It was just because they had used unstructured programming and hand optimized to the hilt. It was just basically the way you solve some kind of unknown puzzle. Make tables and charts and get a little more information here and make a hypothesis. In general, when I'm reading technical papers, it's the same challenge. I'm trying to get into the author's mind, uh, trying to figure out what the concept is. The more you learn to read other people's stuff, the more you're able to invent your own in the future, it seems to me. And you know, I can just picture Knuth here 
decoding, I mean, he doesn't know what these opcodes mean, and he's reading the source codes. And then he's like, oh, I should be able to read a C program and understand <laughs> it, right? Like, I know how the language works. Um, so he echoed sort of Guy Steele's thing, saying we ought to publish code. The Lions book is available. Bill Atkinson's programs are now publicly available thanks to Apple, and it won't be too long before we're able to read that. So I said, well, you know, open source is out there. And he said, yeah, that's right. Um, but he also really echoed the idea that you should read more, read code that's not, and what does he say, don't read the people who code like you. So, you know, I think for him, the fact that he was decoding this machine architecture that he didn't even know was more valuable than just reading <coughs> a bunch of code in something that would have been a little more accessible. Um, so he was the, he was obviously the you know, father of literate programming. He's the one who really uh, advocates for people reading code taking that seriously. So it was interesting to me that everyone sort of thought that was a good idea, but there wasn't as much of it as you might have thought. The other bit, reading, writing, is the other one. Um, and I mean writing code. A lot of people also thought writing English or prose in your native language um, had some connection. A lot of pe you know, people thought, Douglas Crockford said, I am a writer. I asked people, what, you know, are you an art uh, artist or a scientist or a craftsman? He said, I'm a writer. Sometimes I write in English, sometimes I write in code. Um, other people thought there were just similarities in the way your brain worked between writing um, prose and writing code. Uh, though, actually, Guy Steele, who's probably one of the great technical writers, um, was the one who was thought they were the most dissimilar. He felt like, you know, write, writing English. Writing for a computer is very different because the computer is so literal-minded. You just can't get away with as much as you can writing for people. But when it comes to writing code, this seems, again, no royal road. You want to become a great programmer? Write a lot of code. Um, these people, as probably many of the, I mean, maybe, I think it's a necessary, if, but not perhaps sufficient, sadly, um, uh, requirement. If you, you know, a lot of these people, like probably a lot of the people in this room, <coughs> We're just driven to code. I mean, they just code. That's what they do. Um, so Joe Armstrong said, the really good programmers spend a lot of time programming. I haven't seen very good programmers who don't spend a lot of time programming. If I don't program for two or three days, I need to do it. And then he went on to say, you get better at it. You get quicker at it. The side effect of writing all this other stuff, and he was talking about just all these random projects that he was working on, the side effect of writing all this other stuff is when you get to doing ordinary problems, you can do them very quickly. And Knuth, uh, I asked him about, you know, if he still enjoyed programming. He said, oh my God, yes. I've got this need to program. I wake up in the morning with sentences of a literate program. Before breakfast, I'm sure poets must feel this, I have to go to the computer and write this paragraph, and then I can eat and I'm happy. It's a compulsion, that I have to admit. Um, so basically all of these people, you know, were the hacker, they had the hacker thing going. They just had to hack. Um, you know, Zawinski was working at CMU, on stuff related to AI, but he also was just digging into the graphics code on the list machines and writing screensavers, which eventually landed him a job at, um, uh, with Peter Norvig at, at Berkeley. And when he was waiting for the linguist to tell him what to do, he spent more time writing screensavers and, s and said later when he was working a gazillion hours a week at Netscape, he sometimes thought, why did I leave the job where I was just writing screensavers? <laughs> um, Brad Fitzpatrick is just a coding machine, as far as I can tell. You know, he, st he started when he was five, like I said, on this Apple, and as he's, his dad said, he passed his dad up at six or seven, um, and just worked on you know, the stuff he was working on. He wrote LiveJournal because it was fun. Um, and a lot of people seem to be driven by the desire to have something. Now, they weren't just coding in the abstract. They were coding because they wanted to solve a problem. You know, Brad wanted to have a online social website with it so he could chat with his friends and, and post stupid stuff. And so he just did that. Um, he, talk, he describes in the book how he implemented the comment system on LiveJournal as a between classes hack to annoy one of his friends because his friend had said something stupid and there was at that time no way to comment on LiveJournal pages. So he said, I need to make fun of him. I need to put in a comment system. <laughs> and, and so his friend, when he saw the comment, was like, what the fuck, we can comment now? <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people started young, Josh Block, here was writing chat programs to be annoying for his science fair. Um, uh, Joe Armstrong, I was, we were talking about what was Erlang was good for and what it wasn't, and, and he was saying, well, I do some image manipulation, but I just have a, a C program that does the actual image manipulation, because Erlang wouldn't be that good for it. And I said, yeah, and plus, you know, image magic is already written, no need to rewrite it. 
And he said, oh, that doesn't worry me in the slightest. I think if I was doing it in OCaml, then I would go down and do it because OCaml can do that kind of efficiency. If I was an o OCaml programmer, okay, what do I have to do? Implement, re-implement image magic? Right, off we go. Um, and I said, just because it's fun? He said, yeah, I like programming, why not? You know, I've always been saying that Erlang is bad for image processing. I've never actually tried. I feel it would be bad, but that might be false. I should try. Hmm, interesting, you shouldn't tempt me. <laughs> Simon Peyton Jones spent his college years between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. building hardware and trying to write a compiler in BCPL while earning a degree during the day. Um, Guy Steele was everywhere. One of my favorite things uh, from Guy Steele's interview was he taught himself APL from the printout. He went, there was a big trade show and IBM was there demonstrating their new APL and he went up to the booth sort of at the end of the show, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, sort of looked, I don't know, big puppy dog eyes or something at the woman who was cleaning up the booth as she was taking the printout on the terminal where they had been demonstrating the new APL for the whole show. And she said, do you want this? And he said, and she gave it to him. So he had days of printout of APL you know, interactions, and from that taught himself the language. Um, he also uh, wrote a, made money in high school writing COBOL, of all things, that was his first job as a programmer, writing a uh, grading system for a, unfortunately, a different high school, so he didn't get to uh, hack his own grades. Um, and he learned enough Lisp just on his own to be the, ol the first person to score a perfect score on a quiz that uh, this guy at MIT was hiring Lisp programmers, gave everybody a quiz, and he gave it to young 16-year-old Guy Steele, and Guy Steele aced it. Um, and Ken Thompson also, another coding machine, just whatever he wanted. When he wrote Unix at, uh, at Bell, Bell Labs, he thought he was gonna be fired for it because they had just come off Multics, which was seen as a huge disaster. And since they had come off the project, the official thing, they were doing research, but there were some things they were supposed to research and some not, and operating systems was one of the not to be researched things. But he had the itch to uh, write Unix, and he figured, well, I'll write this, and they'll probably fire me, but whatever, this is what I want to do. Um, and so that's what he did. And the rest is history. He wrote, you know, did computer chess, hardware-aided computer chess, whatever struck his fancy. Um, Bernie Cosell, same way. And Knuth took a decade off to write his own typesetting system. <laughs> All right, so. And then I'll just do a little bit on, uh, we've done reading, we've done writing arithmetic. I asked a lot of people about how much math, or everybody, about how much math was really required to be a programmer. So I certainly came out of, you know, math departments. Um, actually, Thompson had an interesting observation that computer science came at different universities out of two places. Some places it came out of math, um, Cornell, whatever, and some places it came out of double E, or like Cal, and you really saw this split. You know, the theory guys came out of math, and then the systems, you know, the people who built Unix and whatever, um, came out of the double E track. But, um, so I asked people about, you know, do you need to learn a lot of math? Do you need, you know, and then also sort of related that formal proofs. Um, there was some suggestion that the sort of standard math curriculum is not that useful for programmers, like ultimately calculus is not really what you want to learn so much as maybe, you know, discrete math obviously, but statistics or probability might be uh, more useful really than, than calculus. Um, on the topic of proofs, most, this was a little interesting to me, almost everybody I talked to poo-pooed the notion of formal proofs. Again, Dijkstra is rolling in his grave. Um, but you know, lots of, basically the, the overall sentiment was pretty consistent. You know, I, Crockford said, I looked at them in the 70s, but it doesn't seem like the, it just wasn't working. Things are too hard. Um, software is so complicated and go wrong in so many ways. Um, you know, people would say assertions are useful, but full-on formal proofs are just not, not gonna happen. Um, Armstrong described taking a course in denotational semantics and spending 14 pages trying to prove that, you know, in two different uh, schemes, you know, let x equal three and let y equal four and x plus y equal seven, and 14 later pages later, he's proven that. He's like, well, how am I going to prove the correctness of my Erlang compiler? Um, you know, Norvig said, I rarely have a program that I can prove correct. Is Google correct? If you get back these 10 pages, you know, if it crashes, it's incorrect. But if you get back 10 pages, are those the correct 10 pages? So that was down the line. That was pretty much, nobody was really interested in proving things correct. Um, Guy Steele, even, you know, Knuth likes to prove things informally correct, but doesn't just feel like, same thing. You know, they, they wouldn't know what all the assertions for even a program, simple program would be. 
Guy Steele gave an excellent example of the perhaps limited applicability of proofs, but he was given uh, a review paper for CACM that was done by a student of David Grise, 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 Grise who was himself a student of Dijkstra. Um, and it was a proof of a uh, parallel garbage collector, or a proof of the correctness of this parallel garbage collector. And they gave Steele the paper to review, and he ground through this proof, checking the proof. And it took him 25 hours to check every step of this proof. And at the end of the 25 hours, he said, there's a step here that I can't, doesn't, I can't make look right. And so he turned that back in as his review, and it turned out that was a, a bug in the proof that was therefore a bug in the program because the proof proved that the program worked. Um, and so then they found there was some one little thing that had to be swapped, and then they redid the whole proof, and they sent it back to him, and he rechecked the proof, which took another 25 hours, and found no, he could find no flaws in the proof. And so, uh, you know, this sort of cuts both ways in the sense that I asked, you know, well, could you just spend 25 hours and found the bug in the program? And he said, no, there's no way. It was this incredibly, this parallel garbage collector with all these interactions, and the proof abstracted it in a way that let him, fi by finding the bug in the proof, it pointed to the bug in the code, but he never would have said, ah, there's a bug in the code. Um, on the other hand, it took him 50 hours, and they still don't know, right? And I, you know, I, I observe that, you know, Dijkstra has this famous quote about, you can't prove by testing that a program is bug free. You can only prove that you failed to find any bugs with your test. And I said, well, it sort of sounds to me like, you know, with the proof, you can't prove a program is bug free. You can only prove that as far as you understand your own proof, it hasn't turned up any bugs. And Steele basically agreed with that. Um, so I thought that was, I found an interesting example of how it can work. It's not totally a, uh, quixotic quest to try and prove things correct, but also how hard it is until we get a little further along with automatic, you know, automated theorem proving. So I guess, um, oh, the one last bit. So we, uh, while we're on Dijkstra, another one of my favorite moments, um, you know, obviously sad that Dijkstra wasn't around to be included in this book, um, so he couldn't defend himself, but my, uh, my favorite moment was I asked I asked a lot of people about Dijkstra has this famous paper on the cruelty of really teaching computing science in which he basically says, you know, undergrads should come in and be given formal symbol manipulation stuff with the predicate calculus for, you know, years of their education before they're even allowed to touch, to actually program. You know, he describes, they'll use this language which we'll be very careful to make sure has not been implemented anywhere on campus so <laughs> nobody can actually program in it. And. Uh, Nobody seemed to think that was such a great idea. <laughs> um, Josh Block said, that's crazy. There's a joy in telling the computer to do something and watching to do it. I would not deprive students of that joy. Um, but the, my, my favorite moment, with all due respect to Josh, was when Knuth, you know, when Knuth starts talking smack about Dijkstra, that's good stuff. Because <laughs> um, who else really can anymore? So, um, so Knuth said, you know, I asked him about this thing, and he said, but that's not the way he learned either. He said a lot of really great things and inspirational things, but he's not always right. Neither am I, but my take on it is this. Take a scientist in any field. The scientist gets older and says, oh yes, some of the things I've been doing have a really great payoff and other things I'm not using anymore. I'm not going to have my students waste time on the stuff that doesn't make giant steps. I'm not going to talk about low level stuff at all. These theoretical concepts are really so powerful, that's the whole story. Forget about how I got to this point. I think that's a fundamental error made by scientists in every field. They don't realize that when you're learning something, you've got to see something at all levels. You've got to see the floor before you can build the ceiling. Uh, that all goes into the brain and gets shoved down to the point where the older people forget that they needed it. So that was, unfortunately, we can't ask Dijkstra to respond to that. But um, so in the interest of leaving some time for questions, I think I'll just leave it there. Actually, let me just close with this. Um, several people, including your own Ken Thompson, uh, were sort of wondering about where modern programming was going. And you know, Ken Thompson said, I don't understand the code they write here at Google. Um, it makes no sense to me. Uh, my, and Bernie Cassell, who helped invent the internet, is now actually a sheep farmer in Virginia, so he's basically out of the game. Though he, like everyone who's allegedly retired, you know, the people I talked to, they can't help but program. 
Um, but he says, I don't envy modern programmers. It's going to get worse. The simple things are getting packaged into libraries, leaving only the hard things. The stuff is getting so complicated, but the standards that people are expecting are stunning. And he talked about, actually used Google Maps as an example of something that like, he knows what's going on under the covers, but he's like, I don't think I could write that code. Um, which I doubt a little bit. And so he closed saying, it's a good time to be an over the hill programmer emeritus. Because you have a, fruit, a few props because you did it once, but the world is so wondrous that you can take advantage of it and maybe even get a little occasional credit for it without having to still be able to do it. <laughs> Whereas if you were in college, if you major in computer science and you have to go out there and have to figure out how you're gonna add to this pile of stuff, save me. <laughs> so you guys are out here adding to the pile of stuff. I'll take your questions. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, the, way, the way I see the difference between uh, um, what really good programmers can do and what ordinary people like me can do is that uh, is like the difference between me and a chess grandmaster is they can uh, keep many, many, many more things in mind at the same time as I can, which gives them, than I can, which gives them the ability to, uh, to find connections and, and solve problems much more easily. Do you? Uh, do other people see things that way? I think so. there was some, um, I asked a, a lot of people about sort of on that topic, but also, and it, actually the analogy applies to chess as well a little bit in the sense that I've observed that sometimes the smartest, s smartest on, in some def the definition of smart, people write the worst code, like the most spaghetti code, because they can keep it in their mind, right? There's all of these little tendrils that are all interlocked and they can, <laughs> it all fits in their head and so they can do it. Whereas other people who are less smart in that way or smarter in another way realize that like even if you can do that, it's better to not and find better ways of, of organizing things. And a lot of people I asked, sort of, I posed that, like do you have, have you found that, um, said yes. Um, that, I mean there's at least you know, two kinds of, of programmers in, in that sense. Um, I'm trying to think who, who really echoed that? I think uh, Josh Block did, um, but and that's and uh, to get back to the chess analogy, that's sort of like you know some people can just this is at a much lower level, but you know I used to play chess with my dad when I was a kid, and he used to beat me all the time, and then I actually learned how to play chess, and I killed him because he was he's just basically smart and can calculate a few a few moves ahead, which was enough to beat a little kid, um, but really had no understanding of what he was doing. So it's it's a, sort of the same thing. Um, but I don't, I think that, you know, with grandmaster chess players and also with programmers, it's not just that they can sort of do more of the same thing, they look at it differently, right? A, a grandmaster looks at a chessboard and just sees the position and sees where the forces are flowing. And so it's not that they're, calc I mean, they can, when they get to the end game, they calculate like crazy, but most of the time they just look at the board and say, oh yeah, yeah this is where the forces are flowing. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I'm just speculating here, same for programmers. Some people just sort of see how things fit together at a maybe deeper level or and see the consequences of bad choices. Hi. So I noticed that pretty much everything you touched on is about the uh, programmer working on something by himself. Um, that's, I mean, mostly <laughs> not what, what we do here or, or I don't know. I mean, is it, is it true that all the all great programmers have to work by themselves because it's, it's, there's too much of an impedance match with others, or or is there in some insight into how we can work work in teams? Right. So the question was. So today I've talked mostly about things that apply to people working alone. What about working in teams, which is obviously um, prevalent? Yeah, I did. I so buy the book and read it because I did talk about that too. Um, probably due to the. Folks that I interviewed, I mean, a lot of them sort of came from a little earlier era when the cowboy, I think, I think half the people I talked to said, I'm the last cowboy coder. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess they can have a, uh, they can fight about that. But, uh, um, but I did talk about how people liked to work with others. Um, XP was a little more in good light when I started thinking about the questions. I was sort of asking that, but you know, I asked people, did you ever pair program? Not a lot of pair programming, but lots of variants on it. People, um, you know, uh, sort of buddy, Josh called it buddy programming, and Joe Armstrong did a very similar thing. Write a bunch of code and then swap, you know, 
uh, Joe Armstrong wrote the early version of Erlang, and then his friend Robert Verding took it and completely rewrote it, and then gave it back, and Armstrong would completely rewrite that, and it went back and forth, and they had a very different style, and they actually improved each other's, he thought, code. Um, Ken Thompson talks about how he liked to split things up in teams. Um, Peter Norvig mentioned, you know, talked, raised the issue of when I asked about, like, what do things, things do people need to learn that they're not learning in school? And he said, well, you know, learning to work in teams is not yet taught as much as it ought and is really the important thing. Um, actually, this book came out, I, I had had uh, breakfast or, you know, a, a lisp get together and Peter was there and I was fresh off of PCL and I was asking people, you know, what book should I write next? And he said, you should write a book about programming in groups. And so I went to A-Press and said, you know, I'm thinking about writing a book about programming in groups. And they said, okay, that's great. We'd be happy to publish that. But first you should really do this book of interviews. Because um, this, this book was A-Press's idea because of the earlier book, Founders at Work. And so they had, they had the idea for it and they said, well, you should do this and it'll take you a few months. And so that was several years ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't write books fast. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, that is, I think a book done like this 20 years from now will have a you know, very different, we'll have learned some stuff about that, that sadly, in a way, the, the people I interviewed didn't have as much to say about because of the era they came up in for the most part. Jamie Zawinski described in great detail, however, how the Netscape people would scream and curse at each other all the time and how that was very productive. <laughs> uh, did you notice a uh, consistency of opinion in terms of the tools of programming, such as IDEs versus plain text editors, or you know, working interactively versus you know, sitting down with a printout? Right. Um, so the question was, was there consistency in tools? I'm tempted to be flip and say yes. Everybody uses Emacs because that was almost true. They were sort of, the, and that camp was divided between the people who were sh ashamed to still be using Emacs and the people who were proud to still be using Emacs. <laughs> You know, some people are like, oh, I should really learn how to use an IDE, but I don't. And other people are like, yeah, I looked at those IDEs, they're terrible, I'm sticking with Emacs. Um, th though on the tool front, a little, you know, partly just because of the different eras that people started, um, there were different tool sets. You know, Dan Ingalls wrote the first version of Smalltalk in BASIC because that was the interactive programming environment he had available. And he's always had a preference for interactive programming environments, as you might guess, given the way Smalltalk turned out. And so he wrote the first version in BASIC, because that was what he had. And he knew Fortran and Inside Out and stuff, but that wouldn't have been a fun way to write it. So um, you know, a lot of people came up in the era of punch cards uh, and dealt with that in different ways. Like I s mentioned earlier, a lot of people, you know, even people who came up in that era had uh, hands-on experience, like I said, in a way that you might not expect. So they, you know, it was punch cards, but they would have access to the machine so they could work sort of interactively that way. Um, as far, but as far as the actual tools people use today, you know, it's sort of what you would expect. There's a lot of Emacs and some people use IDEs and, um, uh, you know, Josh Block still prints stuff out and really looks at, spreads it out all over the floor. I think Guy Steele echoed that. Um, uh, he, this is not now, but Guy Steele described a, you know, implementing and making a big change to the uh, li Mac Lisp system where they wanted to change the way I.O. worked and he printed out the whole listing and took his to his parents' vacation house and spread it all out over the floor and just worked with paper. Um, so there's still that is useful for some things, but you know, no, no big shockers on the, on the tool front, unless you're you know, expecting everybody to be using IDEs, and then you'd be shocked. Uh, it's been, I think, 20 years since the book Programmers at Work was published. Any differences between those interviews and, uh, you know, the, the uh, culture shifts in the interviews you did? So, uh, this, so the question was, th there was a book 20 years ago called Programmers at Work, um, and how did this, what's changed? Well, you know, a bunch of stuff has changed. Uh, that book was, <coughs> I mean, there's a couple differences just between the books, because Programmers at Work was, sort of at the dawn of the, you know, the PC, or I mean, the PC revolution or whatever. They interviewed Bill Gates as a programmer, because um, you know, he sort of still was. And a lot of the people they interviewed were working on microcomputers when they w those were new. And so in some ways, this book sort of goes on both sides of that, because a lot of uh, the people I interviewed really s started before that era and worked on 
um, bigger machines. You know, I mean, there was this, we, we sometimes forget, there was this huge, in a way, step backwards. Um, at the time that PCs and, and micros came out, you know, it, all of a sudden it was back to writing things in assembly. And you know, there was a point at which Microsoft said, okay, now we can start using C. C is not so expensive that we can't, you know, it's, it's not too big and bloated. We can move from assembly to C. But at that same time, people were working on workstations. They had, you know, list machines and the small talk and, you know, stuff was, um, you know, people were doing sort of serious computation that uh, got a little bit lost and now we're sort of finally coming back around. The PCs have ramped up and now they're powerful enough that we can put up with the inefficiencies of things like Python and Ruby and so forth. Um, so, uh, the other big difference between the two books is just that mine is a little more technically oriented. Um, I think programmers at work was sort of, here, you know, everyone was aware that there were these PCs and they had, IBM had the Charlie Chaplin ads and what is it all about? And so, uh, Lammers was trying to get at that for a little more general audience, whereas mine was aimed at, you know, you're a programmer, you want to know how these folks work, um, or think, or live, or whatever. So, um, yeah, and then obviously, you know, anything that talks about the internet is, you know, that's changed uh, how how people look at programming. Open source is much bigger now. Okay, we have one pr one more question. So you're it. Okay, so uh, d d did anybody say something about uh, a negative aspect of what they regret uh, s uh, they see nowadays uh, besides the obvious complexity of software? Um, there's some trends they see as uh, regrettable or s something to be avoided and. Right, right. so the question is, w did anyone have any um, worries about trends that, uh, you know, going the wrong direction as far as they were concerned, um, other than the complexity of software? Well, so that would be the main one. Um, and I don't even know if people regretted that. I mean, so much as, or, you know, uh, it should change just as it's inevitable. <coughs> I guess, uh, in a way, the most interesting on, well, there was some of that, and probably the most interesting was uh, Donald Knuth, and it's hard to say, given who he is, you know, is this just part of, you know, he's a bit of a throwback, the kinds of stuff he works on, he works on alone, and, and it's really not that big, you know, compared to something like what you guys are building here, but he was sort of very vehement about not liking black boxes. You know, he said, I recognize the use of black boxes and abstractions, but he, he said, but I, I, like to, I like to be able to open them up, you know, and like if there's an algorithm and it's packaged up, I, I always think I can open it up and do it better, you know, the, you know and he gave an example, you know, this sort of simple example, but if you have a, you know, matrix multiply uh, um, algorithm, and then you want to use that sort of generic algorithm for multiplying complex matrices, then it's 4x, but if you can open it up on the inside, there's an identity that lets you do it in 3x time or whatever. So, you know, and I'm like, well, yeah, you can open up any box and make <laughs> it better. I'm not sure that's a good strategy for everyone. But he, but he was, I mean, it, it, he felt like, it, he seemed to regret that, you know, and I, somewhere here he said, um, yeah, here it is. Uh, this overemphasis on reusable software where you never get to open up the box and see what's inside. It's nice to have these box black boxes, but almost always, if you can look inside the box, you can improve it and make it better once you know what's inside. Um, and he, you know, just was saying, you know, you, so you get these libraries and now you, uh, when you, you know that when you call this subroutine, you put x0, y0, x1, y1, but when you call this other subroutine, it's x0, x1, y0, y1, you get that right and that's your job. And he seemed to think that was sort of sad. You know, he just was like, it's no fun. Um, he couldn't, you know, really say whether should we, you know, do we have to give up that fund because to build big systems, or should we just stop trying to build big systems? I mean, that that's that's hard to say. But there, and he wasn't the only one. There was, you know, a little Joe Armstrong also echoed this idea of, you know, it's it's good to open stuff up and not be put off by the by the abstractions. And that sort of struck me as a, a friend of mine used to talk about, you know, the Jedi Jedi programming. You know, you're a Jedi, you have to build your own lightsaber before you're, you know. So there's something to taking these things apart and figuring out how they work. Um, but obviously, you know, if we take apart everything, we'll never get anywhere. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Thank you.